<laughs> Thanks a lot um, for having us. Um, I just want to introduce myself. I'm Melissa Piercy, and I am the Director of Education Advocacy for the Daniel Byron Henry Migraine Foundation, as well as the De uh, Director of Education Outreach for Migraine at School. And I am so excited to be here and so grateful for you and your interest in um, migraine at school and for um, allowing us to hopefully help this journey that you're on in working through helping kiddos get through school with migraine and headache diseases um, so that they can, oops, okay, what you just did there did something to my stuff. Hang on one sec. Uh, so sorry. Smaller. Hang on. You. Okay. Sorry. Okay. We're good. Um, <laughs> so um, I just wanted to give you um, an overview of our program for parents. Um, I'm not going to go into everything, but I want to share with you what would be most helpful. Um, and then I'll share our website at the end and you can check it out and find a ton of other wonderful resources. So um, let's just begin with Migraine at School. It is um, a program that was developed in the Stigma and Education Committee of CHAMP, which is the Coalition for Headache and Migraine Patients. And in partnership with coalition participants, the committee has gathered the best resources and information for students, parents, and educators to ensure that all kids with headache diseases are given the best opportunity to excel in school. Slide two. So all of us here tonight know a bit about migraine disease, but did you know that 10% of school-aged kids and 28% of adolescents have migraine? And students with migraine are two times more likely to have school absences. And additionally, studies show that increased absences reduce the likelihood of graduation. Next slide. Dr. Amy Gelfand, a, pe a pediatric neurologist and headache specialist has said, the brain learns from its own behavior. By treating early, we can change the trajectory of the disease. In order to treat it early, migraine must first be diagnosed. Most people do not know the signs and symptoms, nor do they seek professional care or a diagnosis. So early intervention at school would provide a better trajectory for students who have the support of their educators, which will maximize their learning and overall success throughout their education. This is why migraine at school is just so important. So migraine at school is basically a comprehensive package of materials. I am super excited to share them with you um, and to explain their function. So we're gonna start with, um, for the educator, slide four. So this infographic would be given to the school nurse, counselor, front office ladies, or whomever would be seeing the students when they're not feeling well. Often there's a pattern that develops with these kids and this list of symptoms or potential ones can help them to recognize the pattern. Um, also, it offers guidance for caring for a student during a migraine attack. Next slide. This one is for the student. So when a student is exhibited as symptoms of migraine, they'll be given this to bring home and to discuss with their parent or guardian. So it offers tips for self-care, has suggestions to help give the student a voice and encouraging them to advocate for themselves. Giving them a voice is powerful. Slide six for the parent. So this one has the most information as the parent needs to know and do the most for the student. And obviously being a parent, this one's my favorite because of how helpful it is. So first it, um, it has how to help yourself as a parent. It encourages the parent to educate themselves about migraine to help them better advocate for their child. It reminds them to take it seriously, teaches that not all migraine symptoms are head pain. There are many other symptoms like nausea, vision changes, ear discomfort. As a parent, I had no clue what was going on with my daughter and I didn't believe the other symptoms because I hadn't learned about it. So this would have really helped me. And additionally, it recommends scheduling an appointment to see their doctor. Second are the steps parents can take to get their child the help they need like getting a proper diagnosis, encouraging them to see a headache specialist or a doctor who understands migraine. So your doctor might not know, but you can give them information, help educate them, and that would be really awesome too. 
and then getting from the doctor a note or a letter for the school so that you can facilitate a possible 504 or IEP if your student's going to need accommodations. It also suggests how to help uh, the child manage lifestyle choices. So hydrate, eat better, go to sleep, less screen time, that kind of stuff. Um, then we have consideration for meeting with a pain psychologist or other mental health professional to identify coping strategies for recurring pain causes anxiety. And that has been something that I personally have seen so many times um, with students that I have worked with as well. Next, um, we have this amazing list of possible accommodations. And many of these accommodations are one size fits all, but everything can be tweaked to better fit the individual. So um, let's say that your student has a really unique need. That is absolutely something that you can write down um, and change. And Mary Lou will be speaking in greater detail about these accommodations in a bit. Next slide. So now you have all this information and you are ready to go to the school and get some help for your student. This has a list of um, steps you can take that will help you when you're ready to do that. So things like bring a copy of your doctor's note um, and a list of possible accommodations that, and that your student you might already have in mind. And when you speak to them, sometimes counselors and um, just the administration can be a little bit difficult. So use words that will help you, help your students such as my student requires them. It's more persuasive and they are more apt to listen to what you're saying. Make sure you bring a notebook to write down what you need um, during the meeting and, and everything that you discuss so you can refer to it later and maybe remind them if, if the school, if they've missed something. Um, also ask the school to send an email to each of your students, teachers, letting them know about the accommodations when you have your list complete, making sure everyone is on board. And then I personally would follow up with those teachers afterwards, just in case any of them have questions. And then um, also make sure that you ask for a copy of the completed document for your records. This is something that if you end up doing, you'll be um, annually, you can update it, change it, or keep it just the same, but you'll have that copy um, on you so that you can see for yourself what you might want to change and go in ready um, to speak to the school. So um, I would like to briefly mention that we also have a poster um, of infographics that the school uses. We have a lesson plan for health class, and we also have a pediatric and migraine um, headache screen so we can screen kids. So anyway, with all of that information, um, I would like to switch the attention back to Mary Lou so she can discuss more about accommodations. Great, <laughs> thank you so much. So what we're gonna do now is um, I'm going to share my screen. Let's see if I can do it right. And then let's see. Mm -hmm. Ah, here we go. Okay. Okay. Can everyone see that? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, Mary Lou, we can only see, now we can't see the full presentation slide. Hmm. You know what I, mean? I did for a second. Let's see. Oop. Hang on one second. Okay. How's that? Is that better? Yes. Awesome. Okay. <laughs> Let me just move this. Oh. All right. I'm sorry, my dogs have decided to visit right now. So, <laughs> so okay, great. Okay. 
All right, so for the difference between um, what I wanted to do is spend a little bit of time about um, talking about, um, let's see, the, um, the 504 and the IEP. And, you know, does my child need this? Let's see. I don't know why I can't really get that out of here. So what I um, what I wanted to point out was that the the two um, whoop, there are laws that actually protect the disabled student. Um, all uh, U.S. public schools are required to provide a free and appropriate education. Oh my gosh! No, that's my dog. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so to provide a free and appropriate education in, in the least restrictive environment, free of uh, discrimination. And they're really based off um, two federal laws. One, the IEP goes off the Individuals with Disabilities um, Education Act, and the 504 is the um, Americans with Disability Act, which is the ADA. Okay. There we go. So what is the difference? Um, so that is one of the, um, the main things that we wanna um, really point out. And they're actually, um, they're similar, but they're, they're very different. So the indiv individualized um, education plan in general, students who qualify, qualify for the IEP are at risk of academic failure due to the symptoms of a migraine, such as failing grades, excessive absences, disciplinary problems, um, or social problems that disrupt the learning of the environment for the child and the others. Most students with the IEP spend at least part of the day, the school day working, um, really with the special education teachers because they do need some remedial or some specialized instruction. And the one difference too is that the, um, the IEP is federally funded and the, the child would have a case manager that really helps make sure that all the accommodations are being, um, are being met. Now the 504 is, um, it'll carry the same enforcement power as an IEP, but it's not federally funded. So it's really the responsibility of the parent to monitor. So you're really much more involved. Um, the child does stay in the mainstream uh, classroom and is not part of the special education program. And the teachers are really the ones who are accommodating, um, or I should say are ensuring that the accommodations are met. And the interesting thing, which I learned and I wasn't sure, I didn't know this, was that the, um, the 504 plan will follow the child to college, the IEP will not. And I can't believe my dogs are attacking each other as I'm doing this. So, <laughs> this <laughs> didn't count for that one. Guys, hold on one second. <laughs> All right, that's a little embarrassing. Sorry about that. <laughs> oh my gosh. Anyway, so um, the really great thing about the accommodations for students is that there are so many options. And um, Melissa had showed us that what I tr one of the things I truly love is like, where do you start? What do you ask for? What are you allowed to ask for? So the migraine at school template really provides you some amazing information when you're not quite sure where to begin. <coughs> And we, because we really want this plan to, to suit your child. You know, there, there may be limitations to what the school can provide, but most accommodations aren't like heavy overhead or, you know, uh, or very um, difficult to provide. It's more of just taking the time and explaining what your child needs. Um, so things like no penalty for absences or tardy, you know, when they have a migraine being a little bit more flexible with dates if a child misses school because of a migraine, they're not penalized for late work or have a little bit more time to study. And also too, um, like alternate testing and, you know, like a quiet room, 
you know, or if some ch children too actually do better with verbal testing versus writing it down, because the process of getting it from up here down onto the paper is a little bit more difficult. I know that my daughter actually, she um, did some testing that way and it really worked out very well for her. Her teachers were really great. And sometimes too, even being excused from things like pep rallies or even gym, because inside that closed area, sometimes that noise can be a trigger for some children. So, and this is honestly like a tiny little tidbit of items and things. And, you know, what I find is you don't want to be too granular or too tiny specific, but, you know, really focus on some of the key things. Missing school is probably one of the main things you want to look at. You know, flexibility with due dates and things like that can be really helpful as well. So um, what I, the, the question I always ask is, um, you know, like what, like why? Like, you know, um, you know, my school has been great. Why would I even need this? And my, my comment to that is, you know, I love to hear that schools are great, but they're great until they're not. And the problem is sometimes you think things are going well and then you have it not go well. You know, and for me, um, you know, my reason is my Lena. This is my daughter um, on the bottom. I know she's so cute. <laughs> when she was five years old, that's when her migraine journey began. And this is her at 15. Um, she obviously loves dogs and why we have two huge German shepherds who just paraded through the video. But anyway, <laughs> so um, her, the reason why um, she, we were in a very small public private school, like, I mean, it was so tiny and they were great to, for her accommodations. The teachers knew she had migraine. She was to be let to go to the nurse when she needed to, et cetera. Um, and then there was a day when she was um, running around at recess and usually right after lunch is when she would have her most difficult time. She went into her classroom and asked to her teacher to be excused to the nurse so she could go take her medicine. And the teacher looked at her and said, I saw you running around at recess and playing with your friends. You're fine. Go sit down. Now she's in fourth grade and they're not going to not do what they're told. Um, so she um, proceeded to sit down for the next hour and got sicker. She went into her next class where the teacher just looked at her and she said, Lena, she's like, are you feeling okay? And Lena's like, I'm really not. She's like, let me get you to the nurse. But before they could exit the room, she vomited in front of her class. Now in fourth grade, I don't know about you, but an embarrassing situation like that, she didn't want to go back. Now I get the call from the nurse that she's vomiting, she needs to come home. And I had no idea what had really transpired um, until I got a phone call while we were in the emergency room because she was so sick and I couldn't, um, I really couldn't manage her at home anymore. Her vomiting had gotten out of control and her pain was out of control. I had to bring her to the emergency room. And that's when the teacher called me at, at, on my cell phone and told me what had happened. Now I, for me, it was the day that I realized I had a sick kid and it was a really hard thing for me to accept because you always want to take care of your own. I can do it by myself. And I realized I couldn't. And I was so irate that I was calm, which is never a good thing, <laughs> um, that by the next morning I marched into the principal's office and she had a 504 started by the end of that day. So there are, um, you know, um, like I said, they're good until they're not. So um, for anyone who doesn't have a 504 or an IEP, um, you know, where do we begin? Well, the very first step is that your child must be diagnosed with migraine, you know, or, or headache disorder um, or condition um, to even begin the process. Um, and you are gonna be working with your doctors. You're gonna need to provide medical documentation. Um, so it's, there is gonna be work um, from the parent side. And the process does vary a little bit based on the 504 versus the IEP. Um, and the really the first step is a submittal of a written request for evaluation for your child. Um, and once this, the, the um, request has been received for um, a 504, the school has 30 days to hold a meeting and start developing the plan. The IEP can take a little bit longer. Like I said, that's actually, um, you know, um, with the special education program. So there is more back and forth communications. Um, but it one thing that is important is sometimes the 504 can be 
a little bit easier to, to get. And even if you are going for the IEP, they do require that you've tried some other accommodation first. So if you can get that 504 in place, first off, you're starting to take care of your child and getting in some accommodations to help them. And you can also be working to the next step. Uh, sometimes if you go straight for the IEP and you get denied, sometimes it's then harder to even get the 504. So um, those are just things to think about. Um, but if your child does need like curriculum changes, like they're not able to do the curriculum as it is, just starting with the IEP might be your best bet. And a curriculum change would be something like if for the class they require like to write um, like a four page paper about the ocean and clouds and your child really is unable to do that, but they'd you know rather be taking pictures and, and doing a verbal, you know, that may not be meeting the, the uh, curriculum you know, so they're, you know, something like that, where, you know, if they're not able to perform the way that the school needs them to, to meet their, you know, requirements and such, that's where the IEP may be um, necessary in your case. But um, it's important to know that the process can be lengthy, but it's really best, you know, for your, in your, in your child's best interest. And the other thing too, is that um, if you have it, may you never need it. Like, you know, that's like a great thing where if you don't need it, but at least your child's protected should things change. And just a few tips and tricks. And I am by no means an expert in IEPs or 504, but I'm just a mom who had to dig through and figure it out on her own and then learning. And then, you know, um, like I said, I wish I knew about migraine at school, like before I started, because I would have made it a lot easier. But Hopefully, you know, you'll find that these resources are so easy to, um, to work with and they're so helpful, um, you know, as you, as you work through the process. And, you know, the first step I would say is, you know, check out the school's website because that'll show you who you have to reach out to, um, you know, for, you know, looking into or starting the 504 or the IEP. And honestly, you can go directly to your principal, you know, like go straight to the principal, go straight to the top and they will help you. Um, and like I said, I call out a lot because I just love the resources, um, but the resources um, at Migrant School, it can help your child. You can give them to the nurse, like we were saying, the administrators yourself, and even your family so that they start to understand um, you know, what's going on and can, can help support you as well. Um, and also too, one thing is that remember that the, um, the 504 isn't like, um, it's a fluid document. You know, you can change it as often as every 30 days of the 504, but you at least want to have an annual meeting, you know, before the school starts, the school year starts so that you can relook and make sure that everything, um, you know, if your child needs something additional or if something isn't needed anymore, you can make those adjustments. And also when they transition from like grammar school to middle school, then to high school, there's different testing and things that you want to make sure that you're being aware of, especially when you move into high school, like the ACTs and the SATs, you might need more accommodations, like more time. And that actually has to go out to the, to the board that performs that test. It's not your school. So they have to apply for the accommodations through, um, I think it's called the college boards, um, if I'm not mistaken. So that can uh, take a little bit, um, you know, more time or just making sure that you're aware of it so that if there is something your child needs that you can, um, you know, you have time a little bit before the school year starts or right as the school year starts just to give them the best chance for success. And I can't stress advocating enough, um, you know, consider becoming um, an ambassador for migraine at school. I am, love it. And it's a lot of fun and it really helps you bring it into your school district, um, help your children advocate for themselves. like. I told my daughter that day, like, if your teacher says you can't go to the nurse, you get up and you go, you have mom and dad to back you, you know, and, you know, cause kids are afraid and they're also don't want to be pointed out as the sick kid. I don't know about any of you, but that was definitely something my daughter does not want to be. And she wants to stay under the radar. So, um, you know, so those are things that we have to help them get their voice and it takes a little time. It gets a little shaky in the beginning, but they get a little stronger um, each time that they stand up for themselves. And, you know, and even when they get picked on, um, you know, I do feel like one of the, the greatest moments this past year, actually, and my daughter's now 15 and has been having um, her migraine journey for, she's been in it for 10 years. 
we were, um, her moods, I don't know about your kids, but her moods aren't always great. Sometimes she's a little bit sharp and <laughs> I'm being kind. And her sister and I were talking about it. And I said, well, you know, I said, sometimes, you know, your moods aren't so nice. You're not so, so kind to us. And she said, mom, you know, it's not me. It's my migraine disease. And that was the coolest comment she ever could have made to me that she knows it's the disease and she's working with it. And she's, you know, she's really um, coming at it in a different direction. So that was a huge win for us and for her. So thank you. <laughs> All right. I'm going to stop my share. And I'm going to change my view. Okay. <laughs> so, and everyone, you know, feel free to unmute yourself. Um, I'd love to hear, um, you know, I, I would really love to hear too, um, you know, how many people have a 504 or an IEP or I know somebody does. <laughs> 504. <laughs> so, um, and let's see. And then also too, um, oh great, uh, Meredith, 504, 504. Okay, so let me look at some of the questions here. Um, why does the IEP, why doesn't the IEP continue into college? One of the, the reason I believe, and I can get a more specific answer is that because it's through the, the Department of Special um, Education, which is a, a K through eight system. And, but the one thing too, with the 504 um, going into college, it still requires a lot of work. And actually your child needs to be the one that leads that charge, which I thought was kind of interesting um, that they need to, you know, speak with um, every school is a little bit different. You know, every state is a little bit different. So it really depends, but they do need to go in and speak to, um, you know, their advisor to find out who they would have to talk to. But I do love the fact that, you know, they really have to advocate for themselves because now really they're on their own two feet. Um, you know, so that's something that can be um, really helpful as they, as they move through, um, you know, and it, it protects them. And then let's see. Can a student graduate high school if exempt from required PE? Um, the question is, um, wait, hold on. Oop, I think I missed somebody, hang on one second. I'm trying to go down systematically. And also just so you know, Elizabeth put in the infographics in the chat. So please um, check those out um, and download them. And you can even go to their website where they're all be located as well. Um, we included no doctors. Um, so uh, Maddie said that we um, included, um, so when our kids have a migraine and, and some schools are very accommodating, you know, like you just need to have the note and things like that. And, and that's okay. And I just, um, sometimes the migraine condition can worsen things like that. So I always, I just encourage the 504 just to, um, just in case, cause like I said, for my daughter, we didn't need notes, we didn't need anything. And then we have the day that the one teacher decided that she made the decision that my daughter wasn't sick enough. And, and I was shocked, actually, I was shocked. And she tried to apologize. And I really was like, oh, you know, that's fine. I'm like, but maybe you need to educate yourself on, <laughs> I wasn't really happy with her. So I'm not gonna, <laughs> but, um, but I mean, if it's working for you, I mean, I'm not saying you have to do it, but it is something, especially as your child moves on to the higher education, if their condition does worsen, you know, it might be something to think about. So uh, can the student graduate high school if exempt from the required PE credits? That would be a direct question for your principal and your district. But usually if they are, if they have a 504 and there's an exclusion and it's approved, I can't see why that would be an issue. So, but I, I don't want to speak out of turn, but definitely um, speaking to them directly would be, would be helpful. Um, let's see. 
Right. Someone had said that, um, you know, check with your school regarding the PE. Most public schools will work with you, but private schools don't have to follow it. They can make some of their own um, decisions, I guess. But um, my daughter currently is in a, a private Catholic school and actually they don't call it a 504, but they call it like an accommodation plan. And they have been, um, they haven't missed a beat. So I think if you come in with it, it does, it can help that as well. Um, let's say my 14 year old daughter has an IEP going into ninth grade. Great. Okay, good. 504s, 504s. Love this, love this. <laughs> okay. Let's see. 504 provides the request for accommodations from the College Board and Act. Yes, Susan, thank you for putting that in there. Um, a funny story is my daughter, we applied for that, and she's going to be a, a junior next year. When she was a freshman, we had put that in there, and they actually denied us. She would, you four times you were denied? it's frustrating. So yeah, so I, I'll be honest, I didn't fight because she wasn't taking the test, but I'm going to, I'm sure have to uh, keep trying a little bit harder this year. And hopefully she won't need the accommodation if we can't get it, but um, doesn't mean we're not going to try. So, but thank you, Susan. Hey, Mary Lou, can I ask a question? Of course. So um, when my daughter was taking the ACT, um, she was at a private Catholic school and because she had an accommodation for something else, they didn't even ask for that. They just gave her the extra time. Really? So I wonder if, hmm. if there's a way to get around that. Yeah, because she is um, just in hers for any of those um like the, the state tests or what, what do you, I can't, those standardized tests and stuff, she has the accommodation for that. So I'm not sure if, I'll definitely talk to them, but yeah, I got the official letter from the college board saying, no, she has to take it like everybody else. So, which was surprising, a little disappointing, <laughs> but yeah, I'll definitely, uh, you know, maybe I'll shoot everyone an email when I win. <laughs> Let's see. Um, okay, we have never lived in the United States for the school year, so I've never heard of a 504. I suppose it doesn't work internationally. She was freshman high school, and I live in Africa. Most um, actually, that's interesting. Internationally, I don't know the answer to that. If there's a comparable, does anyone, Elizabeth or Melissa, do you know if there's for international like? I've been, I've been Googling it frantically oh. trying to see what, what I can find. There is interestingly a European PTA. Um, oh. I thought that that might be a place to start. And there were um, some images for something similar to a 504 plan that has worked in Europe. So um, I think there's probably some stuff out there, but I don't know of anything specifically off the top of my head. Yeah, what we can do is, um, yeah, we'll keep, we'll look, um, like I said, yeah, I'm not quite sure, but yeah, starting, just starting even with this, the school district or the principal, you know, for the school that um, I'm sure there's something comparable is probably titled something completely different and run under a different, well, it would have to be under a different act because that's from the United States, but, um, you know, but um, I'm sure that they would have something, some sort of special education you know, department that you could, you could speak with. Um, but yeah, that's a, I'll look into that too, to see, cause that's, that's a really interesting question. Um, and then uh, my daughter used to go to a private Catholic school and sometimes that we had trouble with specific teachers. Now she goes to a charter school and everything has been great so far. Oh, uh, good. I'd love to hear that. Um, in PA, the PSSA and Keystone exams are not time tests. Keystones are now graduate requirements for many high schools. Oh, that's good to know. So if there's no time limit, that can really help any of the children who need that time and a half or double, you know, double time to, to complete the complete the testing. You know, uh, a friend of mine, uh, someone has said, is it worthwhile to hire a special education advocate for the IEP meeting? Um, if depending on your school district, I know a friend of mine whose daughter didn't have migraine, but had other um, learning disabilities, 
she actually needed an advocate to help her um, get all the needs for her daughter. Her daughter did require additional, um, you know, special um, services. Um, so that was something that she she did need um, during her um, during her meetings. And that might be something to add. Ask your district, you know, or ask a guidance counselor or whoever is, you know, working with your you and your um, your child. That that might be something to see if do most people get those, you know, and they might be like, no, it's not necessary, or we would encourage it. And I don't think there's a charge, if I'm not mistaken, um, to, or, or it's a minimal charge to hire the advocate. Because I know my friend, um, you know, it was not, it was something that she ended up needing to do because she was have, struggling getting the accommodations for her daughter. Um, let's see, I suffer from chronic migraine. My daughter got her first migraine at 11, now 12. Her, her pediatrician said it's a migraine but won't refer her to a neurologist until she's had a three month, had it for three months. Uh, she gets them one to two times a month, but she's debilitated for three days. So it, um, I, I would just, uh, you, if you want me to, sorry. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> teacher and me hates the chat box. I'd rather just unmute. Um, no, no, no. Anyone who wants to talk, so, I love it. I yeah. feel like I'm like a brain, like, you know, yeah, from thing, wah, wah, wah. <laughs> at least you have some cameras on because in distance learning, I didn't have any cameras on. So I'm just talking to myself the whole time. Um, <laughs> so I get, I have chronic migraines. I've actually had a migraine every day for the last two and a half years. They just do not stop. Mm -hmm. um so that's why I look like trash right now but that's okay um her pediatrician was just kind of like those are migraines um but she's not old enough to take medication yet just give her give her ibuprofen and I'm like if you knew anything about migraines you knew well what I've learned is ibuprofen is trash for a migraine <laughs> um so anyways so I do that but she's in bed I mean cannot do anything they are they are the because mine like mine are mine have days where like I can get through them and then other days where you're just out. But should I just go back and really just push your pediatrician to see a neurologist? Because that's I want to go in and be like, if you if this was your child and you saw what she was going through, mm -hmm. you know. So I'm just kind of like I because I want to get her on a 504. Her grades are okay, but she misses like three days of school in a row. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that, no. I mean, I would definitely, you know, talk to the doctor again. Do you have to have the doctor refer you, like based on your insurance? Okay, um, yeah. you know, or and that, and you can request that. Say, I'd like her to see your neurologist. I mean, one or of the headache important things. Yeah, Just is a headache specialist. I did ask her to do that. I said I have chronic migraine. Like I, I go to a headache specialist, but I had to be referred. Um, and I said, can you refer? I said, I know she's going to need a referral because I've already gone through all this. So I'm, you know, I knew what to say. So I, and she goes, well, she needs to have three or more migraines a month for me to refer her. No. And I said, I said, even one a month, if you saw, you know, I, I haven't heard that criteria. <laughs> yeah. She's like, mom, just give me some of your migraine medicine. I said, baby, I can't like, mm -hmm. I've tried 35 different medications and she's, you know, on I, ibuprofen because her headaches or her pediatrician. So I'm just like, say she has three a month. Yeah. Well, she, so that's, I'm just frustrated because then when I see people saying I have 504 and I'm like, well, I want her to be on that because she's in advanced math classes, but she's not going to be able to keep up with it. If, if she doesn't have these accommodations, you know, they're going to be like, oh, you can't hang. It's like, she can, mm -hmm. but not if she's on a three day migraine binge or whatever, <laughs> you know, <Yeah>. like, <laughs> Yeah. And, so, and the one thing too, that's really important to know about, you know, episodic M migraine, which kind of seems like was what she is, is, you know, that yeah. can turn chronic if not treated. So she has a better chance that earlier we, you can intervene or, you know, have intervention for, for her is a better chance of her not ever becoming chronic. Um, so I would, yeah. you know, I would definitely, you know, even call the office and say, listen, I want a referral to a headache specialist or, you know, a pediatric neurologist you know, and because I want my daughter to be evaluated, you have the absolute right to ask for that. That's what I thought, but I'm just, anyways, okay, thank you guys. That's why I'm like, I have a bunch of you on here that can I just ask? That's why I was like, I got to ask these. No, please, everyone just ask questions that. and yeah, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> Hi, can I pick it back on that for a moment? Absolutely. Okay, um, in terms of that, what you can also do additionally is, um, in requesting, you can um, 
go to the office. They have, if I don't know, it's called homebound in my school and it's an extra additional protection that they have for the absences. And it kind of piggybacks and like, you know, sisters with your 504. Oh, wow. So that's also just something additionally that you can have so that, you know, when you're communicating with the school about when the migraines are happening and about the extended time that your child's gonna be out, it also allows for them to alter the grades at that point. So like say the school year ends at a certain point if you're on the homebound, you have additional hours so that you're then able to extend it to accommodate your child so your child can do their best work because they couldn't do it within the time allotted. Mm -hmm. But it's not a question of you know ability, but it's a question of capability because they can't because they're physically unable to do it. But it's not a question of their intelligence or you know execution. Because when they're okay, they're really okay. So that's what you can get to sister with, you know, the 504. So we actually had that as well. I am so glad you brought that up because I had completely forgotten about it. But in our state as well, you can get that through your school. Um, and the purpose of all of this, I think we can agree, is to keep our students in school. Mm -hmm. And if we're managing the migraine, then we can keep them in school more efficiently. And um, our home program actually provided us with someone who would actually shuttle the homework back and forth, had someone come in to talk to my daughter to make sure she was understanding everything. And this was all free of charge. And this is at a charter school, so state funded. Um, so that is such a good thing to keep in your back pocket, especially if you're having struggles getting into the proper doctor. So get you can tag that onto your 504 for sure. Additionally, and the other thing I want to say about your child, getting your child the, um, for the neurologist, what I also did was call over to your insurance company and ask to speak to a case manager, because then that way that person can be like um, managing your child's health care within your insurance. So there's a lot of services that then get provided so that, you know, if there was, you know, you know, due to depression, anxiety and all the different things that go along with our kids, you know, you can get the mental health services, you can get all of the things that you need to treat the whole child, but you can call over to your insurance company and ask to have um, an evaluation to have a case manager. And it's kind of like a patient advocate and then they'll take over the care of your child and they'll call you monthly. They'll check in with you if there's anything that you need with an in, in insurance or even sometimes within, you know, school papers, they'll be able to provide that for you. It's a very, you know, personal relationship. We had one for over a year and it was so beneficial because sometimes I would just need to call her and be like, look, you know, this is what's going on. Is there anything you can do to assist? And a lot of times she was able to assist, you know, both with the insurance and just personally. Thank you so much, Susan. That's wonderful information. Really hey appreciate guys, that. Uh, hey guys, real, appreciate real quick, this is Matt and Rhonda. We're listening under Maddie Jane, our daughter. Um, oh, hi. <laughs> Sarah, hey guys. Um, first of all, great information. Sarah, my wife and I are sitting here shaking our heads that you have to go through that nonsense. That's absolutely ridiculous with your pediatrician. Um, and I'm sure everyone else uh, on the chat is, is shaking their heads as well. Sorry, you have to endure that. That's insane. Um, Susan was talking about homebound instruction. I know in the state of Pennsylvania, I'm a, I'm a school counselor. My wife's a preschool teacher. So we have some, wow. some inside information. In the state of Pennsylvania, you do need a doctor's script in order to receive homebound instruction. And part two of that, and this goes for anybody, find that one person at school that will listen to you. Find that person who gets it, who understands, who might even be able to relate personally or professionally and help them be your charge, help them be your advocate for your kid or your kids without a doubt. Sometimes you won't get the right person, but work hard enough and you'll find the right person. And Sarah, again, sorry you have to deal with that. If it's us, new pediatricians starting tomorrow, how about it? Yeah, and these are like, in our area, these are like the pediatricians to go to. So I made another appointment for her August 10th. Um, and so I'm just gonna go in and be like, 
I'm just not playing around just because again, once my headache specialist says once it, you're right, it, when it goes from episodic to chronic, and she said, once your brain gets in that cycle, you know, that light switches on and it's a cycle, it's really hard to get out. So I'm sitting in here, I'm like, she cannot go through what I go through every day, what many of our, your kids and you maybe. So I, I just need to, I, you know, you kind of doubt yourself like, oh, am I going to be too pushy? And I want to, so you guys have helped motivate me. Susan, I'm going to, I'm going to make sure I'm going to take Susan with me. And usually yeah. I'm, not where I'm like, oh heck no, like you're not doing this. So Susan, I'm going to, I'm going to picture you standing next to me. So, but right there with you, sorry. like, yeah, yeah, give it to him. <laughs> no, don't take no take no prisoners. Absolutely. Okay. You have to be strong with them. You'd be surprised. Sometimes then, you know, they when they know that you're serious and you have your knowledge there mm -hmm. and what they're supposed to provide, period, for every student, whether or not they have any kind of special accommodations or not, you just have to be pushy. And mm -hmm. there's nothing wrong with that. That is what your job is and you get it done. <laughs> I thought too, and I thought I was saying all the right things, knowing because I have you were, know, I, you I were, but you were, but they weren't have a person who was willing to listen to you, and so that means that that's a check. No, we're not going to be in relationship anymore. Yeah, so maybe I see, like you guys said, either a different person in the group or a different, just go somewhere entirely different. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate everyone. Thank you all so much. Of course, Sarah. Of course. I was going to say, if you have to say she gets three. Bring in a calendar, show a tracker and say, here's her three from the last three months. Like yeah. if, if, if you have to play a game to get your daughter care, then play their game. You know, then that way you don't have to switch providers and you can just get in right, right away. If that's her metric, then meet the metric. You, you know what she, what's going on with your kid. Yep. Yeah. And you live it. So you know exactly where you don't want her to land. So you have, unfortunately, personal knowledge of, of migraine. And um, actually, Elizabeth and uh, Melissa, question, I should know the answer. On, on Migraine at School, is there like a form letter to request um, the evaluation for a 504? So we actually have a form letter you can bring to your doctor. Um, okay. It literally is as simple as doctor, I, doctor, and then fill in the blank. Have seen this patient fill in the blank, and they have been diagnosed with migraine disease or whatever it is. And then um, with that, you can have the doctor recommend that your the parent gets to um, list all of the things that that student might need and that they're the expert on their student, not him for what they need in school. So yes, that is available. Perfect, thank you. And also too, that even for anyone here who already has a 504 IEP, um, regardless of that, the information um, for migraine at school is there's a lot of different things. There's educational tools on the website that can just help manage in general. So I strongly encourage, um, I know in the chat, the um, Elizabeth had put the link in there so um, to the website. So definitely, I, I strongly recommend checking it out, spend a little time roaming around there. Um, you know, there is some, some great information. And also too, uh, Charlotte, thank you for the call out. Um, we do, um, we have support uh, at, my, at Miles for Migraine, um, we have support groups. We have actually a teen uh, support group. Um, I know Susan's son uh, has gone to that in the past. Um, and it's actually, it's run by a licensed clinical social worker and it's um, every other week. And it's really, it's from ages 13 to 19. And the kids actually kind of talk to other kids who are living the same journey. Um, and sometimes it's really nice to be able to not feel alone and not have to re-explain what is a migraine? What do you mean you have, it's not just head pain, you know? And so it's kind of nice to have that community. And then um, we also have a parent to parent support group, which is the first and third Wednesday of every month at 8 p.m. Uh, and that's Eastern Standard Time. I actually host that. Um, as you know, I'm a mom with a daughter with chronic migraine and I too actually had my uh, chronic migraine starting at age five. So I was, I lived it and now I'm, and I'm lucky. I mean, I'm one of the few who around 30, my migraine disease dissipated. Um, and I thought my journey was over until my daughter had her first migraine attack at age five. So um, my perspective is maybe a little different. 
Sarah, not so much, you know how it is, <laughs> but for, um, you know, so we would love to have you, Charlotte comes, um, Susan comes and, uh, you know, for um, our parent to parent group. And it's nice because, you know, you kind of just talk things out if you're having a bad day or looking for ideas, or sometimes you learn about a different treatment your child is doing and you can bring it to your doctor too. I mean, we don't tell you how to treat, <laughs> but it's kind of nice to, to be able to talk to others who, you know, like really understand how you're feeling. Good. Can I just make a plug for something? Sure. <laughs> so migraine at school is um, really catching on. And um, I am a huge advocate, obviously, of the program. And we offer an ambassador program for anybody who would like to be an ambassador. You just um, hop on a webinar with us, get our quick training on the materials. And then you have a ton of resources. You have a support group of ambassadors and you have most importantly, the Migraine at School team behind you 100%. Um, we are in several states and we have anyone from mom to whomever doing this and it's really easy to do. So here's the, the motivation. Um, if you don't want to get it into your school, you give me a call or email me and I will get it into your school. Then your school's on board with a whole migraine program mm -hmm. and they understand migraine and you're helping other students as well. And we'd love to help you do that. Um, but if you want to be an ambassador, please join us. I'm an ambassador. Love it. Strongly encourage it. I know Susan is. <laughs> is there any other out ambassadors out here? I'm not sure. I'm trying to look at names. So yeah, it's it's definitely worthwhile. Like, um, I love it. Like you can bring it out. Like um, I actually uh, team up with someone who we're, we're kind of working in the Connecticut, New York area, um, you know, to bring it into schools and such. So, you know, definitely something to consider. It's, um, there's, um, the link was just put into the uh, chat. So if anyone wants to click on that, thank you for putting that in there. Um, so it's just some way to, you know, really help, you know, give yourself some support behind you to bring these, uh, this great program into your school and help your child and help others and maybe even help someone who hasn't said anything because they don't really know what to do. You know, and that's the big thing. Like, you know, there's still a stigma around migraine disease and headache conditions, um, you know, where are you, you know, it's, are you telling the truth or really how bad is it? You know, like people unfortunately still just don't understand. Um, so it's, it's nice to help educate others and, and help others at the same time. So. Right. And if it's not your bag, that's okay. Someone will do it <laughs> for you. So just reach out. Yep. Great. Any, um, any other questions, any other comments? No. Well, I, we want to thank you all so much for joining us. This was really great. I do hope it was helpful and educational for everyone. Um, you will be getting a, a little email um, with a survey just to let us know, um, you know, what you thought, um, other topics you'd love to hear, because we would, um, you know, love to come back out and chat and, you know, check out our links, uh, Migraine at School, Miles for Migraine. Um, you know, we're, we're here for you and we want to, you know, help you and the family because, you know, a child doesn't have migraine alone. It's, it's really the family. Um, and I always like to do a little call out to the unsung hero, which are the siblings who also too have had a lot of their lives changed or plans canceled last minute, um, you know, when their brother or sister are sick. So, um, you know, it's, it's a family affair for lack of, for a poor word, choice of words. <laughs> so, but all right, well, Elizabeth or Melissa, anything you want to add or? Please feel free to reach out via email or you can contact us through the website. Great. And just thank you so much for being here tonight. Awesome. Thank well, you everyone you for having us. Yes. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, thank you for from Migraine at School and Miles for Migraine. And, you know, definitely check out our websites and um, great resources and hope to see you all very soon. Thank you. All right. Take care now. Bye-bye.